I have two children, so I tell a lot of bedtime stories. And here's this one. Once upon a time, I was an adventurous foreign correspondent. I roamed the world. I moved constantly with my passport in my pocket. And I plowed through disaster zones like a housewife plowing through Costco. <laughs> and now, I am a housewife plowing through Costco. <laughs> and that last disaster zone that I saw was when my six-year-old vomited into the swimming pool <laughs> after he had eaten watermelon chunks. So it wasn't pretty. So what happened, right? What happened? Kids, they're what happened. Now, at some time in all our lives, we will ask ourselves the question, should I have children? And increasingly, for many of us, the answer is no. <laughs> or maybe just one. And you know, it's easy to understand why, because kids are very expensive. <laughs> and there are no guarantee of financial or emotional stability in your old age. And if you're working full tilt at your career, you're going to be better at one job or the other. Probably not both, because there are only 24 hours in a day, right? And you're going to spend all 24 hours feeling guilty, because <laughs> you're only one place at one time. And in 2008, I was coming up against some of these now or never questions as I was coming to the end of my fertile years. I was working in the Wall Street Journal in China. And we just won the Pulitzer the year before. I just wasn't sure if I could get off that merry-go-round. It wasn't easy for me, this kid from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to get that far. And I just simply wasn't sure if I could really juggle being a mother with being a news hound working two time zones. And then China's biggest earthquake in decades happened. This was an 8.0, and it ripped through central China with more force than the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. They even felt the tremors as far as Bangkok. And more than 70,000 people were killed, which is about half the population of Pasadena. Now, when Sichuan is the source of a lot of um, China's migrant labor, so when this earthquake happened, there were a lot of people all around China who were desperately trying to get back home to find out what had happened to their loved ones. And I followed a group of migrant workers from Beijing to their home village. And it was a very long journey that took well over three days. It spanned a distance of somewhere between New York and Chicago. And for most of this, we walked, we took trains, we took boats. They were too poor to fly. And besides, the, the quake had ripped up all the ro roads and rails. And when we got back, for a lot of them, it was a sad homecoming. They came back and they found a lot of their kids had been killed in the earthquake. And not only that, because this area had been a test ground for the one-child policy, before they launched it nationwide, many of them lost their only child. And in a matter of just weeks, I saw a lot of parents rushing to hospitals, desperate to reverse these sterilization procedures that they had been forced to have, which is also part of the one-child policy. For example, I met this couple, the Jews, and they had lost their 16-year-old daughter in the quake. And within 10 days, he was back in the hospital to have a reverse vasectomy. He was 50 and she was 45, but they were desperate to try. They told me in, in their village, you know, their neighbors were just starting to shun them because they saw them as a childless couple that might be always borrowing things, be hel helpless people with no children to protect them. And I will never forget that 
tremor in his voice when he said, when I see my friends with grandchildren, it's, it's really hard. And then when all this was happening, I discovered that I'm pregnant. Right, so I am f having a child when I am writing about other people who have lost their children. And this much unexpected happiness amidst other people's misery, it just felt obscene. And I was pregnant for three months, long enough to see the heartbeat, long enough to get excited, and then after three months, the heartbeat stopped. And for the next few years after that, I would spend my time trying to get pregnant. It felt like this was a job that I hadn't finished, that I had an incomplete assignment. And through the course of this trying, I just kept coming up against people who were facing the one-child policy. For example, when I was in Beijing and having IVF, I met a lot of people who were using it as a way of getting around the one-child policy. Because if you get twins or triplets, it's considered as one live birth. So you are not breaking the rules. And so this kind of spawned that whole buy one, get one free policy. <laughs> and when I didn't get pregnant, I decided, okay, I gotta give up the job. Maybe if I move away from China's pollution to sunny California, I might get lucky. But even here, I kept bumping across many Chinese nationals who were having fertility treatments, many of which were either illegal or hard to get in China because of the one-child policy. I mean, I remember talking to a woman in Brentwood, California, and she had had three children by surrogate for a couple in Shanghai. I also met many, many people who had been involved in the China adoption process, which is also a byproduct of the one-child policy. For example, I met a farmer who had his daughter stolen from him, and he now believes that she's growing up in Illinois. I met many girls who had been adopted here, who have grown up, and are now torn in their loyalties between their families here and their desire to search for some family back in China. So time and time again, I would come up against people who were forced to very explicitly calculate the cost of parenthood against the backdrop of the one-child policy. Because it made it very clear, there were fines. If you broke the one-child policy, you could um, lose your job, you might be liable for all sorts of very heavy fines, or you might even be taken away for a forced abortion. And so after 30 something years of this policy, China was having big problems. Their birth rates were plunging, and they were gonna have big, big problems maintaining their economic growth rates or taking care of their elderly. So last year, they decided to switch things up and they moved to a two-child policy. And then they started actively encouraging people to have more children. So that's right, the one-child policy became the please have one more child policy. <laughs> but very few people are biting. And this is because the one-child policy has fundamentally changed a lot of people's understanding of what it means to be a parent. Having one or none is now seen as the ideal for success, for happiness, for a less crowded society. Approaching childbearing with a mindset that is three parts calculation has become ingrained in China's psyche. And so as a result of this, in the next 10 years, China's population is going to fall. By 2100, it could have fallen to about 500 million, which is about what it used to be in the 1950s. And now, no other country has ever drastically reduced its population uh, without war or disease in, the way, in this way. And this will transform Chinese society to the point where one in three people are retirees, where schools are going to close and be replaced by retirement homes and hospices, where children are increasingly going to become a rarity 
Some of them may be spoilt singleton little emperors, perhaps. <laughs> so maybe the greatest object lesson of the one-child policy is we cannot be too rational about parenthood because it was and will always be a great leap into the unknown with an infinite capacity to stretch our understanding of what it means to live and to love. And so this is the part where I come to the end of my story. I gave up my job, I wrote a book, I became a mother. And when I look back at the turn my life has taken, I hardly recognize myself. I, there's no more sudden jaunts to exotic places. There's no quickening of the pulse for a fast-breaking story. I have to stay rooted. I have to give of myself. I have to lose myself. Now at night, I still tell my children bedtime stories, and some of them are old Chinese folk tales, like the story of Chang O, the Lady on the Moon, or favorites from Hans Christian Andersen, or the Grimm Brothers. And most of this have a magic landscape where mothers sometimes exit, where stepmothers appear, where children are cast out, where eternally hungry wolves prowl. And one day, I'm going to tell my children the story of a country that was once so poor, the emperor ruled, that each family could only have one child and how a great sadness came over the land and people gave away their children or stole other people's children or sought the help of magicians to make that single precious child that best and brightest in the land. And how a great sadness came over the land and fewer and fewer babies were born and it became a country of the old. Now I don't know the ending to that story and then I will lie awake, listening to the rhythm of their breathing, the most peaceful and frightening sound in the world. <laughs> the end. <laughs>